This is Johnny and Jose with Tiger Bomb MMA, and tonight we'll be breaking down UFC 257, McGregor versus Poirier 2. We'll be going over the entire fight card, giving you our thoughts and predictions on the matchups, possible parlays that we might do. But uh, to get started on the first car, or first fight of the card, I should say, we've got Amir Albazi versus Zaga Zumagulov. I was waiting to talk about this matchup for quite a bit because I noticed something with the matchup uh, when it comes to Albazi. I'm not sold on Albazi. I like Zagas in this matchup. He's coming in as a minus 125 slight favorite. Albazi is a plus 105, according to Tapology. I like Zagas in this position because I like what I saw even in defeat against Julian Paiva. I bet Paiva during that fight. And I had some moments there where I was a little worried because when when Julian, or not Julian, when um, Zalgas goes forward, he's pretty damn good. He'll he'll attack takedowns. He'll throw nice little punches. If I remember correctly, he does tend to spin sometimes. As for Albazi, his last fight was against Malcolm Gordon. He looked good during that matchup, right? Gordon, I believe, during that time was a favorite for that that fight. We come to find out that Malcolm Board Gordon isn't ready for the UFC yet. I saw some tape on Albazi. His fight with Shorty Torres was concerning. For those of you who are planning on betting on Albazi, he does have a tendency to kind of panic if he gets pushed back. He is a, a pretty decent striker, but his bread and butter is a jiu-jitsu. Uh, I think Zagos is going to push him up against the cage, just kind of beat him up, go for takedowns. I don't think he'll be able to submit Zagas. Zagas is a pretty solid guy. I predict Zagas getting his first UFC win by decision. I'm actually going with Amir on this one. While his last fight, uh, he submitted Malcolm Gordon. I was not too high on him, uh, but I did see his potential uh, in the submission game. Uh, and I do think if he pushes uh, his his ground skill his ground game on Zalgas uh, he will come on to, he will come out on top either with a submission victory or possibly even a decision due to ground, ground control uh, i think that's his best bet here uh, he should go with the strength uh, and and i'm also going with the fact that he is 5 years uh, 5 years younger uh, than Zalgas well Zalgas i don't know if he's necessarily out of his prime yet uh, i think in this particular division the uh they're fighting at 125 the flyweight division i see uh mir a lot closer uh to his prime just because in, you know the little guys once you get past 30 years old uh you know you're over the hill at that point uh so i think those two things uh, i see Zal, uh, excuse me amir coming out with the either uh, most likely a decision victory due to ground control, uh, but possibly uh, even taking a submission win here. Our next matchup at featherweight, we've got Nick the Carney Lance versus Mosvar, the Russian Dynamo, which I'm calling him that, Evloev. A matchup between the undefeated 13-0 and Evloev and Nick Lance coming in here with a record of 30-11-2, uh, and two, over 40 fights, the veteran. Interesting matchup. There's also a 10-year age gap between these two fighters, the Russian versus the American. Uh, Evloev coming in here at a minus 415, a heavy favorite. Uh, come back on Nick Lenz is plus 300. It's hard for me to disagree with the with the line because I don't see a way Evloev is going to lose this matchup. He really has displayed within his last few fights his progression as an MMA fighter. His fight with Mike Grundy really impressed me. I love the way he was able to keep calm in that in that fight. He was in a very deep choke. He got out of the choke, and then he just battered Mike Grundy for the rest of the fight. His, his grappling is excellent. His takedown defense is excellent. His striking is getting better each fight. I don't see a way Nick Lentz can win this matchup at all. I... Well, I guess I can. I guess if Zogas happens to slip on his own sweat and he happens to land in Nick Lenz's armpit, Nick Lenz can get a guillotine. But of course, I don't see that happening. If it does, dear God, I jinxed it. But I have Evloev here. I'm staying away from that line. I, I like Evloev a lot. I don't see a way he loses. But at that line, I'm not sure if I want to even do a bet on it. I might do a prop 
I think Nick Lenz is a tough dude, so I do see Evloev winning this matchup by a decision. I agree. Uh, I unfortunately went against Evloev in his last matchup against Grundy, and that was due to uh, not being necessarily impressed uh, by his performance with Barzola in his uh, second-to-last fight, which was uh, over a year ago. That was a huge mistake on my part. Uh, Evloev is the real deal. Uh, he's in his mid twenties, so he's primed to knock, you know, knock on the door into the top fifteen pretty soon. I'd say within the next two, three fights. Nick Lentz, uh, being ten years a senior, I don't. Um, he is at the twilight of his career. Uh, he, unless Evloev comes in, uh, either unprepared physically or mentally. I don't see Nick Lentz uh, winning one round on this. Um, I see Evloev minimum winning this fight 30-27, but he might get maybe a ground and pound in the second, third round. Uh, The odds are quite steep on this one. I might look into maybe a a prop inside the distance or at the very least uh, putting him, uh, adding... Uh, Evloev uh, in a parlay with some with somebody down the line, but he is he is definitely winning this fight. So, at the very least, uh, I would say inside the dis excuse me uh, by decision or pos or uh, I, I might do both. I might put him in in a in a parlay. Our next matchup is at middleweight between Andrew El Dierte Sanchez and Mahmoud Mak. Muradov. The odds on this one are pretty nice, to be honest with you. We've got uh, Mahmoud coming in here at a minus 135. The comeback on Sanchez is a plus 105. Frankly, if this were to happen, uh, I would say a year ago, I think Mahmoud would be a heavier favorite. I think the the line got a little closer because of Sanchez's win over Wellington Terman, where he knocked out Wellington Terman. And I don't think that's really saying much. Wellington's a good guy. Sanchez's bread and butter is his wrestling and his striking has looked better. If, of course, he was able to get a knockout. So of course his striking is getting better, but I don't see a way he can win this matchup. Despite him having really good wrestling, he could be dominating the entire fight, but I still see him getting knocked out somehow. Uh, I cannot see how Mahmoud doesn't use his excellent striking to knock out Andrew Sanchez. I do see this being a knockout in round number one for Mahmoud. I just think he has a higher ceiling at this point. Andrew Sanchez, even again, if he's dominating the fight, he does get tired as well. And the fact that most wrestlers, well, not all wrestlers, but most wrestlers, once they get a knockout, they get a taste for the knockout and they try to keep it standing just to get that sensation again. That might potentially happen here with Sanchez and it's going to be his downfall. Again, Mahmoud, round number one knockout. Excellent point. Uh, I do believe Muradov will take this fight. uh, And uh, per your analysis, I think the KO, TKO prop uh, might sweeten uh, the odds even more, uh, bringing it up to plus money uh, or possibly even sprinkling a little bit uh, on that first round finish uh, for Muradov. Uh, While they they aren't too far apart in age, uh, I do believe that Sanchez is past his prime, you know, past what, you know, he could, he could have, uh, could have possibly accomplished while his last fight, uh, with Wellington Terman, uh, was, was okay. I mean, it was a TKO. Uh, he did lose to Vittori, uh, and we've seen, you know, what Vittori is capable of now, uh, but he did, did lose to him, uh, about a year ago or so. And his last, you know, his, his loss previous to that was uh, over three years ago. But uh, I think Murdoff's ceiling, like you said, uh, is a lot higher. And I think he's on his way up versus Sanchez. He's either going to kind of remain where he's at uh, or, you know, well, slightly kind of on his way down. Uh, so I'd say Murdoff, um, yeah, um, for sure. Uh, he's worth, I would say, putting in a parlay. Uh, possibly even with Evloev, Ev- Evloev, excuse me, uh, and sprinkling a little bit on that uh, KO prop. Very, very good prospect. Our next matchup at light heavyweight, we've got 
the return of Khalil Roundtree versus Marcin Prachnio. And I don't know what to say about this one. The the odds right now are at a minus 335 for Roundtree to come back on Prachnio plus 260. Well, the, the odds right now, honestly, they should be closer. The reason they are so wide is because Marcin has been knocked out three times in a row. His chin at this point is incredibly unreliable and Khalil Roundtree hits very, very hard. My problem with Khalil is that his takedown defense is non-existent really. I've never really seen him successfully take or not take anyone down, but stuff a takedown. And if I have, I just can't think of it. It is a striker versus striker matchup. And frankly, at this point, Khalil is, uh, I don't know, really like I like Khalil Roundtree a lot. Just that there are certain things that he says that I just, I don't know how to feel about it. He discussed wanting to be the only uh, Muay Thai practitioner in the UFC, just solely Muay Thai. And then that didn't work out for him against Kutalaba. Then again, Kutalaba is a, is a tough guy. He's kind of a wild man in there, but he does have grappling as a, as a ace in the hole if he needs it, which he used it. I don't think Marcin has that kind of grappling. At least he's never displayed it in the UFC. It's safe to say really that Khalil Roundtree is more than likely going to knock out Marcin. Really, at this point, I, I would stay away from this matchup completely. It's a letdown spot completely when it comes to Roundtree. Um, we just don't know how he's going to show up. I believe this is his last fight in the UFC, so I don't know if he is really in the right mindset to fight. Uh there's a lot of questions when it comes to Roundtree. I, I, I like him to win this matchup. It's going to be a fun knockout and a fun fight while it lasts, but I'm staying away from it completely. I do have Roundtree to win by first round knockout. I think you hit it right on the nose. Uh, Roundtree, while not overly impressive in his last two losses uh, to Kutulaba and Johnny Walker, especially. I mean, that looks really bad, especially considering how bad Johnny Walker has looked uh, as of late. Uh, on the other on the other side, we do have Marcin, which has lost uh, thrice uh, to, I would say, low, mid, and fairly high level competition. Uh, in you know we we, we know where Sam Alvey stands, but uh, Magomed Ankalev, uh, he's been pr- very impressive as of late as well. We know how tough that guy is, and then he got KO'd four months ago um, by Mike Rodriguez. They're both. I would say they both have their backs against the wall. More so, Marcin. You know, due to his three losses, this is probably his last chance. If he doesn't show up here, he will. This is his. You know, the last time he will ever see his name in in the UFC. But also, I think Khalil. Khalil hasn't been over. Has not been overly impressive in his UFC tenure. His last loss to Ian Kutalaba. Seen. You know what Eon's all about in the last year. Didn't 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 really impress me, uh, and I guess they're trying to keep, maybe keep him around, or you know, see if he's or maybe see if he's worth keeping around by feeding him marching. But like you said, this is definitely a letdown spot just due to, just due to not due to, but due to. Well, maybe due to. We'll see after. Yeah, that. yeah. This may just due to the odds. Um, I think they should. They should. They shouldn't be that high. I would say. Maybe it should have been a two to one favorite, you know, minus two hundred at the most. But they're inflating this to, you know, they're saying Khalil's going to come in and murder this guy. Which, you know, after doing uh, any anybody analyzing the fights, will will see that. But we know how that has worked out with these overly inflated odds, uh, especially in the last year. So I too will stay away from this. Uh, I see, I anticipate Khalil taking the fight, but. Anything can happen in the fight game. And this is just one of those feelings where with Khalil, I don't know, it, it's just, you know, you get you get a funny feeling where you think you need Alka-Seltzer, but it's just remembering what Khalil brings to the table. It, it just makes you take a step back and say, hell no, I'm not betting on that. To, to me, this is the equivalent of a women's MMA fight, which we're going to talk about shortly. So I'm staying away from it. And speaking of women's MMA, next up we have at bantamweight Sarah McMahon versus Juliana Pena. Odds are right now uh, minus one twenty-five for Sarah McMahon and minus one hundred five for Juliana Pena. 
these two are the epitome of the women I would never bet on. Personally, because me and uh, Juliana Pena, well, she screwed me over once and I never forgave her for it. Not in real life. I bet on her and she let me down. And Sarah McMahon, she's just incredibly inconsistent. It's funny enough, Juliana Pena got choked out by Jermaine Duran in her last fight. And I find it funny that the person who gets choked out randomly the most is Sarah McMahon. She just finds a way to get put in a position where she gets choked. I don't really know who to go with this one just by looking at it. Everything favors Juliana Pena. It's a really close match. It's more than likely going to be a split decision when they're both grapplers. One has a better pedigree than the other, but the other's a little tougher than the other. Um, Sarah McMahon being the better pedigree, and then Juliana Pena thinks she's the tougher fighter. It might come down to that final round. I see Sarah McMahon out grappling Juliana Pena for the first, say, round and a half. Then the second round like the second portion of the second round might favor Juliana Pena and then the third round for sure Juliana so with the judges more than likely not really paying attention or watching the fight it could literally go to either girl because it will more than likely be a split decision either that or Sarah McMahon's probably going to get choked out randomly if I had to make a pick I'd go with Juliana Pena I'm not betting, betting any money on it at all but yeah, if they can get a draw, and that way no one wins, that's fine with me. I am going with the other side. Uh, I'm actually, I think McMahon might pull out, might eke out a split decision. Uh, she might get the better of the grappling for more than a round and a half, I'd say. Maybe, maybe you know, close to the two, first two rounds. And then Juliana, depending on, you know, whether she's worked on her cardio or not. She might eke out, you know, uh, ten nine in the third round, but this is yeah, this is going to be too close a fight. This is they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel in this fight, uh, even for women's MMA. Uh, I'd say I'm not. I'm I'm thinking McMahon as the side, uh, either by split decision or yeah, you 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 have a point. This could very well be a draw, but I'm definitely saying this goes the distance. So I'd say look at the over. Uh, the odds are pretty spot on. This is a very, very close fight. But, yeah, I'm, I definitely see this going over. Oh, having this go over is most likely my sure bet. I'm not betting on this fight. I'm staying far, as far away from this as I am staying from Khalil Wildtree. But I see McMahon at least getting a round and a half to two rounds worth of grappling and going over. There's not, not really much to say, or I'm not sure why I wasted so much time on this fight, but let's move on. Our next matchup at middleweight, we've got the returning Brad Tavares versus Antonio Shoeface Carlos Jr. I don't really have much to say about this matchup. Again, it's it might be a loser leaves town matchup. It's hard to say that because Brad Tavares has been a staple in the middleweight division for many years now. I like Brad. Uh, Shoeface, he's been very unimpressive his win streak isn't the best he's beaten just kind of the bottom of the barrel in that division excluding Tim Bosch Tim Bosch has been one of my favorite fighters but at that time he wasn't in his prime anymore so it's like it is what it is and when it comes to Brad Brad's beaten quite a bit of people in in the middleweight division he's beaten everyone's favorite fighter Elias Theodoru he's beaten Talos Latis and his last win was against Jocko, which was, what, two, three years ago? His last two fights uh, were against Israel Adesanya, where he didn't get finished, which is good. And concerning, he got knocked out by Edmund. What we know now about Edmund, that he uh, has a very clear wrestling deficiency. It's a little concerning, but to be honest, I'm not going to put too much stock on that loss. It was about a year ago. It was a really nasty knockout, but I still think Brad has a better place in the division than, than Shoeface. I don't really care for him too much. His cardio is unreliable. His grappling's great, but we've seen what happens if he can't really implement that grappling. He just gets tired and he accepts the position that he's lost. I think Brad is going to come back after a what a year layoff i think he would have taken that time to really heal his body uh, come back stronger he'll more than likely be the stronger guy in there 
I predict a decision by Tavares. I, I don't see how either of these guys could finish each other. Antonio might have the grappling edge, but I don't think he'll be able to submit Brad. And Brad, I don't think he would knock out a fly, so he wouldn't knock out shoe face. So yeah, Brad Tavares by decision. That's funny you say that, because as you were saying that, I was picturing Homer uh, punching, uh, you know, punching uh, Moe's mitt where the fly lands and the fly still, you know, manages to fly away. Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of Brad Tavares there. Yeah, that's how that's how I was picturing Brad's training uh, going. I do see Brad having the edge on the feet, while on uh, Cara de Sabato has the edge on the ground. But neither guy, I think, is good enough either on the feet or on the ground to take the other out. I think this will be two guys with not great cardio or really spectacular. Uh, ground game or uh, striking to I think this is uh, the odds actually reflect um, how close the fight is uh, with Brad being a slight favorite at minus 155 and shoe face being the underdog uh, at plus 120 this is going to be I think a decision um, whoever I think they'll most likely be on their feet and that will slightly edge out Tavares so I do see him come out with a split decision or possibly a draw depending on how boring these guys make the fight but I do see the fight going to decision so that might be a parlay piece for worth a parlay piece I think the decision for sure our next matchup at lightweight we've got Nasrat Hat Paras versus Armin Saruk 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 is on fire Sarukian I like this matchup quite a bit. Uh, we've got Sarukian coming in at a minus 250 favorite. The return on Nasrat, he's a plus 200. It's a battle of the young up-and-coming lightweights, and I'm, I'm very excited. This is probably one of my favorite fights on the card. Sarukian has impressed me since his debut. He came in here, I believe it was on short notice against Islam Makachev, and he stole a round from him. It was great. Like I, I rewatched the fight. It was one of the more entertaining ground fights, and yeah, he looked he looked impressive. He beats uh, OAM, which who doesn't these days? And more more impressively, he beat Davi Ramos. That fight I bet on Sarukian, and he just easily won that fight. He mixed in his takedowns perfectly. He uh, controlled Davi Ramos. He was able to really land at will sometimes. Even some weird techniques like spinning kicks and stuff like that. As for Nasrat, he is he's a very skilled striker. His last fight was against Alex Munoz, who is primarily a uh, team alpha male grappler. He's a wrestler, so he was able to defend the takedowns, but Alex Munoz is, what, 6-0 and at the time, so he's not very experienced. So, yeah, he looks good against you know uh, an up-and-coming nobody, but how is he going to look against Armin Sarukian, a guy who went all three rounds with Islam Makachev and looked pretty damn impressive? I've actually got Armin to win this matchup. I think it's not going to be as easy. I think it's going to be a close fight. For sure, a decision. I've got a 29-28 for Armin. I think he's just going to be... I wouldn't say he's the better striker because Nasrat, he's a damn good striker. But I think the ability to mix in the takedowns while being comfortable striking is going to lean in the favor of Armin. I think he'll be able to get the edge on the decision just with the implementation of the takedown. So he'll land a couple punches and then maybe duck under, get a takedown, and then just edge the round. So for those reasons, I've got Armin to win via decision. I agree. I think Armin is the more well-rounded fighter, despite that I thought they were actually further apart in, in age. Armin's 24, Nazrat is 25. While Nazrat does have uh, pretty good striking, I would say Armin is better well-rounded, being that you know he did hold his own, at least in the first round, against Islam. Uh, the odds, however, you know, are, are way off on this, I think, at least by minus 100. If he would have been a minus 150 favorite, I think it would have been worth a shot, but... 
this has the makings of uh, what was the guy that uh, got beat down by um, Brunson, Shabazian? <laughs> this has all the all the makings of Shabazian all you know over again for me. Uh, I don't have the confidence to bet on this fight, but I do anticipate him winning. Uh, I don't want it to be that you know he comes up that Nazrat is his Brunson, which. He very well could be. I mean, he maybe Nazrat is that guy who, you know, punches like a truck that he's never encountered before. Uh, so that will, you know, put a halt to his grappling. Um. So yeah, I guess I went around in a circle there. <laughs> well, I will say I do like that saying that that uh, one fighter is another fighter's Brunson. That's a great saying. <laughs> it's like uh, Diaz is Connor's Brunson. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, yeah, it's yeah. That that could be another saying. You know, he's his Diaz. Nazrat could be his Diaz, Uh, but we won't really know. I I think you know. I'm not counting out Nazrat. I think the the line is way over, way overpriced for Armin. This is a lot closer fight than you know minus two fifty is. You know, they're basically saying that Armin's going to come in here and dominate from the from first bell to to the either finishing him. Or to the closing bell, which I don't doubt, but not, you can't really count out Nazrat like that. He's not, you know, he's not, um, he's not that type of fighter that you can immediately count him out, especially the fact that he trains out of TriStar. So I'm pretty sure uh, the coach there, his name escapes me, uh, you know, genius guy. For Zahabi. Zahabi, yeah. I'm pretty sure Zahabi's come up with a plan and has prepared. Uh, uh, Nazrat to the best of his ability so it'll be I think it'll be a close fight but I, I do see Armin edging him out the odds for sure have been inflated I, I wouldn't say that they're ridiculous honestly I agree with them a bit but I think for Nazrat to be a plus 200 it all has to do with that Drew Dober knockout I think that really dropped his stock because no one really saw Drew Dober knocking him out yeah that's true uh he did yeah I think that definitely brought his uh, it happens guys get caught you know it's like that guy um damn it there you go again it's like uh not woodley this guy he had the supposed ko of the ko of the year last year with that spinning oh buckley kick buckley yeah it's like buckley you know koing impa and now going forward you know and going into his next fight impa's gonna have that stigma of oh hey this guy's gonna get knocked out again but that was like timing, and it's not like he worked on it. He just, I don't know. I don't know what came over him, but it was just that kind of that kind of thing. And I think Impa's going to come back and, you know, probably for, perform well. Same thing with Buckley. You know, he got head kicked, KO'd, and I, I think he's just hoping, you know, for his next fight, he's not going to fight a long, tall, lanky guy again who doesn't get KO'd either by head kick or by punch or whatnot. It's a very good matchup, a matchup between Marina Rodriguez and Amanda Hibas. And talking about lines, this line I honestly think is a bit inflated. We've got a minus 320 on Amanda Hibas to return on Marina Rodriguez is a plus 240. That honestly, it, it's well-deserved, right? We've got the respect on Amanda Hibas. She has proved herself to be one of the top in the division. That, and you know, everyone loves her. She's just so damn likable except for that laugh, but uh, I, uh, it is what it is. I like Amanda. She's she's adorable. For Marina Rodriguez, for her to be a plus 240 is ridiculous, in my opinion. Even though she let me down versus Carla Esparza, I do have to give her some props there. Despite her takedown defense being god-awful, she at least works from the bottom. She has a Carlos Condit-esque way of just working from the bottom, despite the fact that no judges ever give her the round. <laughs> Even though she's outworking her her opponent, they just don't give her the round. I think she's too damn comfortable doing that. For Amanda Hibas, it should just be a single takedown going into a submission. I don't think it's going to be that easy. I think this fight actually will be a very tough matchup for both ladies, just because I, I feel like both of their styles might just clash. Just Marina Rodriguez is really good at Muay Thai. She's really good in the clinch. Uh, Amanda Hibas has got great striking, great judo, great jujitsu. I, I just think 
a battle between these two Brazilian warrior ladies is going to be a lot closer than most people are really anticipating. Marina Rodriguez comes in here with a height advantage of a, she's five foot six. Amanda's a little shorter. She's five foot three. Uh, oddly enough, she happens to have a one inch reach advantage over Marina. It's going to be actually a really, really good fight. I'm looking forward to it. I, I still edge out Amanda. I think she's more of a well-rounded fighter, but to be honest, that doesn't necessarily mean she will win. There, there are paths to victory for Rodriguez to, to come in here and potentially even knock out Amanda. Um, you bring it up a lot. A lot of the time when girls are on their Instagram a little too much, they might not necessarily train as hard. They just kind of get up, caught up in that lifestyle. A Marina, I don't think she's doing that shit. It's a possibility that she can come in here and knock out Amanda. I just think, honestly, that Amanda's too skilled. I think she's going to just edge it out a decision. I don't think, I don't think she'll submit or even TKO Marina. If anything, I see Marina possibly knocking out Amanda. But I do have Amanda coming in here and picking up the win by decision. I agree. Uh, the line on this is definitely way off i think it's a lot closer fight while i do think that amanda that amanda is definitely the favorite here i would say the line should definitely be closer to like minus 120 to 150 you know to amanda and then marina definitely should be plus money it wouldn't be such a bad thing to take a shot on marina here uh as the underdog just due to amanda not being as aggressive uh, on the takedowns uh, as Esparza was in her last time out, which uh, was a huge letdown for me as well. Uh, I would, I was, I own Rodriguez there, but Esparza, she just managed to just make that, uh, you know, uh, leg humping fight. Sucks, but uh, learn my lesson. Do not bet on Marina Rodriguez against a ground fighter. While Amanda is not necessarily a ground fighter, she does she does have pretty good ground skills. Uh, and I say that because she actually decisioned Mackenzie Dern, and we saw how what a turnaround Mackenzie Dern has had in the last year, going from being known strictly as a ground fighter to having okay stand up, not not necessarily world she's not world class. She doesn't have world class boxing or striking by any means, but she hasn't proved her stand up. And the fact that she dominated uh, Random Marcos, and, and it's not really so much to say that she dominated, or I should say, dominating Paige Van Zandt doesn't really say much, given the you know the level, uh, basically just her all around game, uh, Paige Van Zandt that is. Uh, I do see Amanda being aggressive uh, from the get go, um, and. Marina, I, did, I definitely think she will get her shots in, but I think Amanda is just going to be able to mix it up uh, and take that decision. Uh, I don't think she'll be able to finish Marina by any means. Marina's fairly tough, but she will be able to just outwork her in the fight uh, wherever it goes, either on the feet and transition to the ground and vice versa. I, I think she'll just be too much for Marina at this point, and I think she'll pick up the W via decision. Maybe... Uh, Maybe split decision, depending on how, how good Marina has worked on her takedown defense. If she didn't work on it, if it's still shit, then yeah, Amanda's going to definitely take this. So Amanda should be maybe a parlay piece. If not, look for the decision prop for Amanda. That, that will help things help things get down to if you just want to go straight on her, which I uh, I would go also. Our next matchup at lightweight, we've got the battle of the heavy machinery. We've got Otman Izatar, the bulldozer, coming in here against Matt Steamroller for Vola. I like this matchup a lot. Uh, Otman, we've seen what he can do in the UFC. He's knocking dudes out left and right. Uh, one is more impressive than the other in his UFC tenure. He knocked out Timu Paklian, doesn't belong to the UFC. Very scary knockout. And comma worthy, he just used his head as like a vertical bouncing ball because he just beat his brains in severely. As for Matt Favola, he is a dog. His nickname is perfect because he will come over and <laughs> he'll come over. He'll go after you and try to run your ass over. He, 
he has a deficiency when it comes to his striking. Not to say that he's not a good striker. He's a decent striker. It's just that he, I don't know, he kind of gets goaded into, into battles that he maybe shouldn't be doing. Uh, same thing kind of with Ottman. I, I've seen a fight uh, with him and Charlie Leary where it was a back and forth one round fight where he got dropped and he came back and won that fight. But I feel like the, both men can potentially get caught up in their ego and then just start swimming, swinging for the fences, not swimming. Um, so it, it's a very concerning matchup, to be honest. Like There's some value in Matt Frivola. He's got good grappling. He will consistently go for takedowns. He'll throw an overhand right and then just duck under and go for it. My concern with Matt is that he got knocked out by Polo Reyes. And Polo Reyes is... He's not worth talking about, but that matchup between the two, I had to go and rewatch it because I wasn't sure how bad that knockout was. And it was pretty damn bad. I didn't like the way Matt Frivola looked. He got clipped, went down, and Ottman can definitely put out Matt Frivola. And likewise, Matt Frivola can definitely put out Ottman. So it's a very, very good fight. It's going to be a, a war for sure because... I'm I'm not 100% sold on Ottman yet. I know he's cost me some money because I had money on Karma Worthy and he let me down. But he has that power. He has that godly power. I'm just really not sold on the fact that he might potentially just be a one-round fighter. He tends to get a lot of one or round one knockouts. And in the UFC, if you can't go past, say, two and a half rounds, you're not very trustworthy when it comes to my money. I do like Steamroller for Bola coming in here. I think he's learned his lesson. I don't think he's going to, you know, try to test himself against a, a heavy hitter because, you know, we've seen what he can do. I think he's going to implement his grappling more and, if anything, potentially even knock out Ottman. Uh, I do actually see this being a closer matchup. Once it goes past the first round mark, I think Matt Frivola is just going to take over. As long as he fights smart and safe, and uses his grappling, pushes Ottman against the cage, tires him out, kind of weighs on him. I think he can easily take this decision, possibly even TKO him on the ground. But I'm going to take a shot on the underdog at plus 125 odds. I've got Matt Favola to win by decision. I agree with this being a very close fight. Uh, I did also. <laughs> Funny enough, Common Worthy did also let me down. Um, so his last fight, I don't know if it was necessarily comma, you know, comma worthy letdown spot or an Ottman, uh, you know, coming into his own in that fight. But if, you know, for, for Vola, I think has enough experience to, uh, to know what to expect here. And I hope he has enough common sense to, you know, work with his team and realize that, Hey, this guy is going to bring the lightning. You know, he's going to, bulldoze you in the first round and if he's come up with a game plan to mix in some take you know some ground games some takedowns uh to get Ottman uh you know to make him uncomfortable enough to hopefully not take his head off uh if to get it past I think his first goal should be get it get this past the first round uh, or possibly you know just work his defense to let Ottman tire himself out in that first round if he does that then I think Matt Frivola in the second third round uh, can take over not that he will. I don't know if he has the the fight the fight IQ to do that. Uh, it might be that he's coming in here and he's going to get hit once and then want to get into a dog fight with Altman and then Altman's going to take him out. This is, I think, this is Matt Frivola's fight to lose, uh, and I say that just because I think he has more. He definitely has more. Uh, he's fought not higher competition, but UFC level competition. Uh, he's fought more UFC level competition, I should say. Um, so I think there there is that bias. I, I think the wrong guy is favored here. I think it's just due to Ottman's last fight that he's the slight favorite here. When realistically, I think Matt Frivola should should have been the slight favorite at like minus one twenty or something. Basically, based off of his last five fights being in the UFC, but it could be that Ottman is just he's going to live up to. I really know. I don't want to say that Ottman's going to live up to his name, Bulldoze, and just bulldoze Frivola. I think Frivola is going to. I don't know. Maybe I'm going around in circles here, but I don't see Frivola getting steamrolled. I, I don't think he's going to steamroll the bulldozer either. 
So yeah, this is a tricky one. I think this is very, very close until it's not. <laughs> More than likely, one of these two is going to get knocked out. And then whoever picked the other guy is going to be like, oh, I told you so. Tends to happen. So <laughs> it's fine to be wrong. <laughs> Take a shot on the other dog. That's fine. You pick the favorite. And that's fine. Yeah, I think it's funny. I think there should be some sort. They should come. I think there should be some sort of bet in MMA to hedge kind of like how they have in the NFL where you have where when you bet on the underdog um, on the spread, for example, if you bet on the underdog, you know, at plus seven, they have to lose by seven points. Right. So you're kind of you kind of have two bets there. They either they win straight out or they have to lose by a certain number of points. I think they should. Glad you said that, because (laughs) I'll tell you what, uh, during the last week's card with uh, Calvin Cater and um, why am I forgetting his name? He just Holloway. Holloway. What the fuck? Anyways, I predicted two things for sure. I thought Cater was going to win, which I look like a fool. But I also predicted that Cater's nose would get broken. Had his mm-hmm. nose gotten broken in that prop, if there was one, I'd be sitting pretty. Interesting that you bring that up. Yeah, I think there should be some sort of uh, some sort of bet like that in MMA, where they, you know, where you where when you bet on the underdog, you're betting that they'll lose by like you know a point or two or something i I don't know i think that would make it interesting and make it more worth than just you know basically betting on the essentially you're betting on the money line here you know in compared comparison to other sports there there is no spread so to speak spread that you're making gambling worse for mma fans (laughs) pretty much well moving on to the next card because we're we got to get through this one as soon as we can. Jessica yeah. I versus Joanne Calderwood at flyweight. Well, uh, we can save some time by just skipping this one. <laughs> I got evil eye, woof, woof. Evil, 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 woof, woof. I can't remember what she said, but yeah, I got evil eye by decision. I can't trust Joanne Calderwood. Yeah, after her last embarrassing fight uh, that cost me money as well, man. <laughs> against, There's a trend going on, isn't there? Uh, this, Yeah. Um, I bet uh, that she'd have enough to take on Jennifer Maya. Boy, was I wrong. Um, I did, however, have Cynthia Calvillo being Jessica I. Uh, So it's kind of half and half. Uh, I think these two are, I have no idea how this fight made it to the almost the top of the card uh, where they almost made this the main event of USC 257 at this point. Well, I I guess the, the name recognition, but yeah, this is this this fight is garbage. I'm staying away from it. I'm um, I'm only predicting uh, this fight goes a distance because neither of these is going to have what it takes to to finish each other, not in the way that I'd like to see anyway. Uh, but let's move on. Our next matchup is our co-main event at lightweight between Dan the Hangman Hooker and Iron Michael Chandler. Very very interesting matchup because I've been going back and forth with with this one. Um, I'm not frankly too confident in either guy. I will say I have a bit of a bias when it comes to Michael Chandler. He was my favorite Bellator fighter. I never missed a fight with Michael Chandler. He's incredibly exciting. Yet there are times where he has mental lapses and he has a lot of bad luck in the cage, which always concerns me. But he is a very good fighter. He's got great wrestling. He's from, he's a tough Missouri boy. Uh, he's a good guy, too. I really like Michael Chandler. Um, his his power is phenomenal. He's uh, the first guy to knock out Benson Henderson clean, which is always a sight to see. Like, I I love him for that. I've never been a real fan of Ben Henderson. As for Dan Hooker, we know what he's going to do. He's going to be Dan Hooker. He's going to go in there, go on your face, throw, that, uh, throw low leg kicks or calf kicks, which again concerns me because Michael Chandler's been hurt to the to the lead leg before with Brett Primus. He he lost a belt to Brett Primus via like a fluke uh, O'Malley type leg injury where he couldn't stand. So that that's a concerning thing. And I know Dan Hooker he doesn't even need, need tape. He's just going to do it. That's what he does. He's a tough guy. He'll he'll always be willing to eat a shot to land one of his. His shots are pretty damn good. They're very clean. His hooks, that's why they call him the hooker. 
and that and for other reasons. Um, it's it's a good matchup. I really like it. I think if Michael Chandler implements his wrestling from the start, attacks the body of Dan Hooker, he can easily take this matchup. I don't think Michael Chandler at this point can knock out or even finish Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker's way too tough. He's way too good. Uh, Dan Hooker can more than definitely knock out Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler has been knocked out before. There's a huge disadvantage when it comes to the to the reach and the height. Dan Hooker is six foot. Michael Chandler's listed at five eight, but I think he's more of a five nine guy. Uh, Sixty nine inch reach for Michael Chandler. A seventy five and a half inch reach for Dan Hooker. The odds themselves are pretty close as well. Dan Hooker is a minus one forty. Michael Chandler plus one ten. There are a multitude of ways this fight can go, and it's all really going to be dependent on the first round and the first thing that either man does. If Dan Hooker lands a leg kick on Michael Chandler immediately, that's not a good sign for Michael Chandler. If Michael Chandler goes for a takedown immediately, that's really not a good sign for for Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker is a tough guy, but his cardio is in question. He's a good three-round fighter, but he does tend to fatigue if pushed too hard. And frankly, he doesn't know how to manage his own energy. He tends to just go balls to the wall and just kind of blows his load out. Michael Chandler has the more reliable gas tank, but concerning again, he's, I don't want to say he's got a fragile body, but it, he's just very concerning. Despite my love and admiration for the guy, I, I worry about the fact that he's fighting one of the tougher guys in the division who is just way bigger than him. I will more than likely, this is just out of, I guess, bias. I'm going to go with Michael Chandler. I think he can get the job done. I think he's going to tire out Michael Chandler, or not Michael Chandler. He's going to tire out Dan Hooker. I think he's got the grappling pedigree to just grind him out, get him tired, and then just coast to a 29-28 decision. More than likely, Dan Hooker is going to win the first round. And to be honest with you guys, there's a possibility for a draw. I can see Michael Chandler getting dropped in the first round, then rallying back after Dan Hooker blows his wad, trying to finish Michael Chandler. Then Michael just comes back and grinds him out, and there's a draw there. But for sure, my official pick will be Michael Chandler by decision. I'm actually going with Dan Hooker on this one. I think I'm not overly impressed with Michael Chandler, especially the competition. And while I was also uh, cheering, you know, when he KO'd Ben Henderson, never been a big fan of Ben Henderson myself. In his last round, he he basically knocked out a guy who's, uh, I don't know how many years over his prime at this point. Uh, and his prime wasn't all that great because he was decisioning Clay Guida and uh, all these other guys when he was in the UFC. I think he's coming in maybe five plus years too late to the UFC. I think he's, I think he's past his prime. Well, as good as he's been in Bellator, I think in, in the UFC, I don't think he's going to hold his own, especially not against hooker. He might get a takedown or two, but I don't think his striking is, will be above hookers defense. I think Hooker will manage to uh, piece him in three rounds since in his last fight against uh, Dustin, Hooker did go the distance with um, with Dustin. He showed you can hang in there, and I don't think uh, Chandler's you know any tougher than uh, than Dustin. Uh, so I see Hooker getting a decision out of this, uh, possibly even a, a TKO. You know, depending on how accurate his striking is and whether he can. Uh, I don't think he'll be able to avoid the wrestling and the takedowns, but I think he'll be able to get up fairly quickly. I don't think he'll be able to, he'll be able to keep him down and ragdoll him or do that. Uh, what did uh, uh, Chandler do to Benson Henderson? He suplexes uh, suplex. that. I don't think he'll be able to suplex. Yeah, I don't think he'll be able to do that. I was going to say, I hope there's yeah, a I think the range and height of Hooker. That uh, Michael Chandler can suplex Dan Hooker, because I'd put some money on that. <laughs> Yeah, I think Hooker's length and reach, uh, I should say length and height, uh, will play uh, will play a role in this as well. And 
uh, Hooker's cardio aside, I, th- I think Chandler. I don't think he'll be. I, I think he's. I don't. I don't think he'll be able to take Hooker. Uh, he may surprise me, but uh, from what I've seen, I think Hooker's going to take this one by decision at at a minimum, uh, but possibly uh, TKO maybe in the first or second round, depending on how crazy Chandler tries to get. Because I see him being cocky and you know see him see him being above all these UFC guys, even though he trains with a few guys. But it's different when you're in there, you know, throwing limp wristed, you know, limp wristed. Um, you know, cat scratches at Usman versus uh, Dan Hooker, which is, you know, he's proven to be a very, very tough guy. I think he might get, you know, if, if he keeps improving, I'm pretty sure he'll get a title shot once Khabib is, uh, um, you know, over and done with. Uh, I do see him getting a title shot at some point, maybe in the next two years, I would say. But, yeah, I'm going with Hooker on this one. Our main event of the evening, we've got Dustin the Diamond Poirier versus Conor McGregor 2. It's the return of Conor McGregor. We are going to see if he still got it or if he doesn't. We, we've seen what Dustin can do at lightweight. He has beaten the who's who's in that division. His last fight, Dustin's last fight with Dan Hooker, epic fight, possible fight of the year if it wasn't for the ladies to take that crown incredible fighter the odds themselves frankly should be closer but they're putting a lot of respect on conor mcgregor minus 275 on conor come back on dustin poirier plus 210 it's uh actually just something that popped into my head i've always considered dustin poirier an honorary mexican because of the way he fights and conor has a problem fighting mexicans but i will say as of late Dustin has become an honorary Mexican, so that might come into play. But my official pick, though, is Conor McGregor. I can't go against Conor. Um, He's just too damn good. And we've seen how well he can look when he comes back after taking time off. He took some time off, and then he came back, and then he fought Eddie Alvarez. looked amazing. He took some time off, came back, and fought Khabib. Looked like ass. But then again, he was on the whiskey at that time. And then he comes back. Again, fights Donald, knocks him out in, what, a minute or less. Uh, he looked good in that in that spot. As for Dustin, we know what he can do. He's a dog. He's a warrior. He's an honorary Mexican, for God's sakes. His loss to Khabib is, it is what it is. Everyone loses to Khabib at this point. His fight with Dan Hooker, he showed how good he really is, like his warrior spirit. It's now the narrative of, can Dustin's chin withhold and stand Connor's punches at this point at lightweight and it's Connor's ability to you know not gas has that improved because if it goes past a certain time at a certain round I would say minute number two in round number two he might be in trouble I think Connor's coming in here in excellent shape and he's honestly just too precise too clean his striking is just on a way different level similar to Max Holloway and Calvin Cater it it shows the fact that yes, Dustin Poirier is tough, but we find out that he's tough because Connor's beating his ass. Um, another thing to add is that the only knockout loss at lightweight for Dustin was against uh, Michael Johnson, and the thing Michael Johnson and Conor McGregor have in common is that they're both really fast and they're both really precise. So I don't think Dustin's going to be able to see whatever shot Connor's already picked to land on Dustin, and it's just going to hurt him really bad because we know his chin is good. His chin has been tested at lightweight. It's just that he's going to get caught unexpectedly. He's going to get hurt, and I think it might be an easy easy night for Connor. Honestly, I think uh, if Herb Dean is refereeing this fight, it might even be considered an early stoppage. So look out for that. You heard it here first. But again, I got Conor McGregor, round number one, knockout, some spinny, winny bullshit. He's going to knock his head off, and then he'll get on the mic and then potentially call out Khabib or just crown himself champion again, and more than likely UFC will have a belt ready for him. I agree. Uh, I think Conor's going to come away with this uh, victorious in the first round, maybe the second round. Um, And I think it is due to their styles of boxing. They're both primarily boxers. 
while Connor has mixed in a few kicks here and there, uh, they're really weak ass kicks, you know, aside from the kick that he got with Cowboy. But, you know, Cowboy's at the end of his career, you know, that kick couldn't have kicked over uh, a, a cherry bush, least of all, you know, one of those bamboo trees that they kick in Thailand when they're training for Muay Thai. And that's just due to how they throw their strikes. Uh, Dustin, he throws power strikes. He tends to throw hooks. There we go. Hooker. He were just some other. Uh, his power comes mainly from hooks. Uh, versus Connor, he throws more straights than anything else. And we know that, you know, a straight line, uh, straight punches, you know, jabs and whatnot, uh, beat hooks any day of the week. You know, as powerful as those hooks might be, as we've seen with, you know, guys like uh, Nganu, you know, he's gotten beat by, uh, by straights, jabs, and such. Because as much as, you know, I've seen some videos of Nganu, and anyway, not to get off topic. Uh, basically, it's going to be McGregor's uh, punching style that's going to, he's going to be victorious, and just due to his accuracy, the fact that he throws uh, jabs, straights, uh, and he's very good at countering. Uh, he's uh, He's got that timing. I don't know what it is, man. That guy's got that counter timing down to a T he's uh and I think that's that's going to be uh Poirier's downfall he's going to come in he's going to have a chip on his shoulder he's going to be like yeah I'm the tougher guy I'm you know but he just doesn't have the same accuracy uh and he can't throw the same type of strikes that Connor can uh, with that accuracy uh so I think that's going to make all the difference here and I think Connor's probably going to mix in a kick or two but he's going to light him up on his feet. And as tough as Dustin is, you know, as much as I like the guy, he unfortunately never bothered to, you know, refine his striking. He's had success, uh, but he's just continued on with the same, with this same old version of striking. He's taking damage along the way. And I think that that adds up. Uh, and I think, yeah, I, I think that's pretty much it. I think it's the difference in their striking. They're both boxers, but Connor throwing, more straight punches with very good precision is the reason he's going to win. So I'll take uh, Connor by uh, KO, TKO. That's going to help um, with the odds as well as probably bring it down to minus one, you know, in the minus 100s or whatever. I will give Dustin a consolation prize, though. I did buy his uh, hot sauce and it's pretty good. It's a really good Louisiana style hot sauce. So if you want to give it a shot, you've got Tiger Bomb's approval. I haven't tried McGregor's whiskey, but uh, it's because I don't drink. But uh, I, I would say Dustin beats him in that category when it comes to the branding. Is it a vinegar-based sauce? I think so. It's pretty good. Okay. But those have been our picks for UFC 257, Poirier versus McGregor 2. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you liked, commented, subscribed, all that stuff. I really would appreciate a comment, though. I really do like hearing your guys' opinion. Let us know if we're wrong. If you just want to chat with us, that's great. Um, but that's been our picks again from UFC 257. Johnny and Jose closing out. We'll see you in the next fights.